Angela. Yes. Floor is yours. So, yes. Thank you, Karen. Um, so to those who are, were able to, to make it, and hopefully uh, more people will manage to, to enter the event, uh, welcome to Pirate Care, Disobedient Solidarity Against Neoliberal Austerity, um, which is going to be uh, a presentation uh, by Tomislav Medak, and then a discussion between initially Tomislav and myself, uh, then hopefully with all participants. So I've met Tommy before <laughs> in events in um, in London, and um, as I'm sure you've read, he holds a PhD um, uh, on technopolitics and planetary environmental crisis. Uh, one could hardly think of two more current modern um, phenomenon, actually, uh, planetary environmental crisis and technopolitics. And um, he's, um, he's a member of the theory and publishing team of the Multimedia Institute MAMA in Zagreb, on which we'd love to hear more. And uh, he's here today as a co-initiator of the Pirate Care project. And his, uh, he is or was an artist in the Performing Arts Collective, Badco. Yeah, it says was. So, nice, yeah. was, <laughs> yes. Okay. Collective is, uh, has closed the shop, so. It's yeah, not, yeah. The, the, the hopefully another. Has left the stage. Another issue we should, um, we should examine the closing shop um, and what causes it, which is uh, often the case these days. So before we proceed um, to Tomislav presenting Pirate Care, uh, I would like to remind everyone about the next talk, which is on the 8th of December, um, same time as now. And it's going to be a presentation by I'll be if I'm not mispronouncing it, Murphy, artist, and I know Brian, um, curator of learning and research at Counterpoint Arts UK, who will discuss cultural policy and the politics of practice, um, bringing their experience from um, socially engaged art case studies, as I understand. So it'd be great to see all of us there as well. That's almost in a month's time. So, um, Tomislav, would you like to start the presentation? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Angela, and thank you, Karen, uh, to both of you for uh, this invitation, and thank you all for <laughs> joining uh, this evening. Um, I will uh, read my presentation, so if I'm a bit uh, too fast or unclear, just please uh, interrupt interrupt me. Uh, okay, let me start. How's this looking? Can you see my presentation there? Not in the way we could before. Meaning? Meaning we no, we only see your ident your your team's identity flashing, but. Um, so you're trying to share. Yes, my screen and it's not coming through. It did. It will come, but for now it's not. So you can't see this. Oh uh, no, I, I cannot see it, but someone else can. Gabor uh, can, and other people can. So it should read disobedient solidarity against neoliberal austerity, and there is pride care banner being shown. Is that what people are seeing? I don't and see people... anything, so I hope it will be recorded. So Karen and I cannot see it because we saw it before and the system decided that we can't see it now. But perhaps everybody else can see it, which is good. So. <laughs> OK, OK, yeah. let, let me get this straight now. Um, let's see in, in a chat. So 
you people can see my slides. Those who can, please respond yes. There were, I think, a couple of yeses. Mm, already, there. yes. The three yeses. Okay. So I'm going to go to my slides and just uh, do let somebody know in the chat that you are no longer seeing my slides if they go missing. Um, <clears throat> in tonight's talk, I will discuss how can we read the future consequences of the present crisis of care that we have faced prior and are continuing to face in the aftermath of the coronavirus pandemic. This I will explore from the perspective of pilot care, a project that Valeria Graziano, Marcel Mars and I have convened four years ago. I will introduce the practices of pilot care, discuss how community care organizing in the pandemic has filled the gap of care, which is structural in its character, yet failed to politicize and contest the larger realignments in the provision of care, driven by forces of private provision, venture capital, and intellectual property. Furthermore, I will discuss the technopolitical implications of our project. These reflections are in many respects dark and discouraging, but provide indications of how we can conceive of real utopias of care, where the care in the community and the public care provision are built in a just and mutually sustaining way. Let, let us start maybe with two canonical definitions of care. Uh, first one by John Tronto and Bernice Fisher. In the most general sense, care is a species activity that includes everything we do to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we may live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining web. And a second definition, or maybe more a comment, if you think about it, is this not what life is basically about? Human beings are projects of mutual creation. Most of the work we do in, is on each other. The working classes just do a disproportionate share of it. They are the caring classes and always have been. This is a comment by David Graeber um, that he wrote for Guardian in 2014, Caring Too Much, That's the Curse of the Working Classes. Um, fundamentally, throughout our lives, we depend on the support of our families, friends, strangers and institutions to sustain both ourselves and to sustain the world in which we and the future generations have to live. That interdependency of humans and non-human nature in social and ecological reproduction defines the relations of care. And the effort to sustain those relations defines the labor of care. Pilot care was convened with the objective to map and connect collective practices that are emerging in response to the so-called neoliberal crisis of care, a convergence of processes that include austerity cuts to welfare systems, the rollout of workfare, the attack on reproductive rights, and the criminalization of migration, all processes that have denied that vital support to many. Against this background of financialized global fun, uh, background of financialized global capitalism, I'm sorry, I have gone too far. Um, over the last decade and a half, we have witnessed a growing wave of mobilizations around care, addressing a number of fundamental needs. The Docs Not Cops campaign, whose logo you can see in the background, uh, with doctors and medical staff refusing to carry out document checks on migrant patients. The growing resistance to homelessness via the reappropriation of houses left empty by the speculators, like in the actions of La Paz in Spain. The defiance to legislation making homelessness illegal, such as Hungary's ban on rough sleeping in October of 2018. Or the civilian search and rescue ships, such as those operated by Sea-Watch, that defy the, de the criminalization of NGOs active to save lives of those crossing the Mediterranean. These practices do not pu push back against the legal repression of vulnerable people, but also against the institutionalized 
negligence of care systems. In Greece, a growing number of grassroots clinics set up by the Solidarity Movement have responded in the last decade to the draconian cuts to public services by providing medical attention to those without private insurance. In Italy, precarious parents without recourse to public childcare are organizing their own private kindergartens. In Spain, the feminists around the collective Ginepunk developed a toolkit for gynecological self-diagnosis to allow all those excluded from reproductive health services, such as trans women, drug users, or sex workers, to perform basic checks on their own bodies. Meanwhile, the collective Women on Waves uh, has been providing safe contraceptive and abortion options to women in countries where these are not available, at times using boats harbored in international waters like veritable care pirates. And they also liberate knowledge where access is denied to public libraries, as in the case of so-called shadow libraries or pirate libraries, which includes our own memory of the world. Uh, it's a shadow or pirate library that is uh, run and maintained by Marcel and myself. Crucially, all these practices share a willingness to openly disobey laws and executive orders when these stand in the way of safety and solidarity and politicize that disobedience to contest the status quo. That disobedience and that politicization is what defines them, in our view, as pirate care. Our project is specifically aimed to activate collective learning processes from the knowledge generated in and through these practices. In this, we have been inspired by the phenomenon of so-called hashtag syllabi, so-called, uh, th that is, crowdsourced online syllabi created by social justice movements in response to situations of intense antagonisms, such as hashtag Ferguson syllabus, created in response to the police killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, or gaming and feminism syllabus created in response to the Gamergate harass harassment campaign against the feminist computer game writers, or hashtag standing rock syllabus created in response to the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota nation standoff against the Dakota Access Pipeline. We have written about the phenomenon in our article learning from hashtag syllabus. In that article, we have also set the program for the work that we were doing with uh, pirate care syllabus of, on which I'll talk a little bit more in a moment. Uh, here you can also see a book to which uh, Valeria has contributed. Her concern was with technologies of care and technology technologization of care is something that we'll see more and more in the future. Uh, and it's a topic of uh, extreme interest uh, to us. Uh, so how people can organize care well, building and commanding technical systems. I'll come to that uh, in a second. Uh, so building on, on that reflection uh, that we have developed in learning from hashtag syllables, we have set out to develop a radical pedagogy approach that would help social justice initiatives write, write online syllabi of their own. The first round of topics for our own pirate care syllabus was written in November of 2019 during a writing retreat organized by an organization from Rijeka Drugomore, and it was launched on March 8, 2020, for the opening of the of Bread, Wine, Cars, Security and Peace exhibition at Kunsthalle Wien. The syllabus, an expanding work of in progress, currently includes topics on criminalization of solidarity, sea rescue and care, common care work and child care, housing struggles, psycho psychosocial autonomy, a peer-to-peer -peer social technology of healthcare, so-called the hologram, uh, community safety from racialized policing, transfeminist hacking, hormone toxicity and bodily sovereignty, gender equality in tech milieus, and politicizing digital piracy. Um, 
To pursue this process of radical pedagogy, we have developed an, an experimental publishing framework or piece of software titled Sandpoints that would enable the syllabi as well as the collections of texts that accompany those syllabi to be collectively created, easily preserved and maintained independently from large digital platforms. Currently, ubiquitous network technologies are precipitating an all-sided deskilling of users in workplace, in free time and in social reproduction. While the mass industrial workforce of the 20th century could acquire a collective understanding of the shop floor machinery and collective understanding how to lay it still, how to sabotage it, with network systems that is all the more harder, as can be seen in the struggle, struggles of platform workers to coordinate, unionize and strike. Thus, in our technological development, we want to uh, build cloud-independent technologies that foster popular techno technical pedagogy at various skills levels, empowering members of collectives to take care of the collective knowledge production and collective memory processes. Uh, in our view, editors, translators, librarians, more or less technologically skilled, are at the center of our collective learning and upskilling enabling us to stand against the loss of autonomy to techno-capitalist forces. Returning to our syllabus, we're planning to organize a collective learning uh, meeting from that collectively write, written syllabus, sort of a summer camp in the summer of 2020. However, that never came to be uh, for obvious reasons. Just a couple of days after we launched the syllabus, as the COVID pandemic was breaking out across Europe, we have rolled out over our work on the syllabus into a collective note-taking effort to document organizing of mutual aid, solidarity and care in response to the pandemic crisis. That work or effort of documenting we have titled Flatten the Curve, Grow the Care. What are we learning from COVID-19? With participation of a broader pilot care community, we have collected and created around 15 notes, instructions and how to's that were coming from and were being used by mutual aid organizations in Italy, Croatia, the UK and elsewhere. The notes included information on how to assist people in home isolation or how to organize solidarity kitchens, information on reproductive rights, home violence and childcare in the quarantine, on mutual aid models, um, models for the jobless, for instance, sex workers, and write-ups on the implications of the pandemic on disability, environmentalism, and technology. They were immediately translated into English, Italian, German, and Spanish, and used widely. However, a couple of months into the uh, pandemic, there was no shortage of resources, many far superior to ours. Documenting practices was also not the purpose of our endeavor, so we have gone back to our work with the pilot care practitioners. Still, we have continued following the care organizing amidst the crisis and reflecting on its trajectory. The COVID-19 pandemic has made many of the pre-existing contradictions of social and ecological reproduction under financialized global capitalism more apparent. Let's quickly look at what those are. First, caring is not intrinsically nice. Care work always involves power relations and processes of discipline, exclusion and harm. It is a necessary and skilled form of labor that is shouldered by workers, mostly unwaged women and migrants, who themselves receive the least amount of care while serving those who take care labor for granted. Reciprocity and solidarity are not implied. Second, the famous graph in the title, uh, in the title, Flatten the Curve, represents two curves standing, okay, maybe let, let, let's leave the curve, two curves standing for higher or lower rates of contagion and an unspecified healthcare capacity represented as a straight line that the ideal pandemic curve should not breach. However, the straight line is never a straight line nor a single line. It actually depicts the decline of society's capacity for care under the relentless neoliberalization and criminalization. 
and it depicts the uneven distribution of healthcare capacity, which was until the pandemic visible only on one side of the class, gender and race divide, uh, which suddenly detonated as a general social threat in the pandemic. Thirdly, now that we know much more about the so social etiology of the coronavirus, it is clear that those who were in the front line and on whom societies depended for the provision of care and reproductive labor, those who had no choice but who, no, no choice but to go to work and who were hardest hit by the ep ep epidemic threat, have remained and will continue to remain the more vulnerable uh, people on the on that side of the class, gender, and race divide. Let me provide you uh, two Austrian uh, examples of disobedient organizing of care workers in the pandemic that highlight and address some of those asymmetries. First one is DREPT. DREPT is a self-organized initiative of Eastern East European living care workers in Austria, founded in 2020 to protect caregivers from exploitation and abuse. The initiative provides counseling, crisis support, and political advocacy for caregivers who are nominally self-employed, but in reality are recruited and dependent on employment agency, agencies, making them ineligible for trade union representation, minimum wage agreements, paid vacation, or sick leave. DREPT argues that if caregivers were entitled to full protection under labor law, the entire system of elderly care would no longer be financially viable, and that this makes agencies, the state, and the bulk of Austrian society complicit in their exploitation. Amid the pandemic, the initiative has built a Facebook community of over 10,000 carers in Austria and organized protests demanding proper employment status and protection for care workers. Sezonieri is an activist-led campaign for the rights of agricultural workers in Austria, which supports the labor struggles of migrant uh, seasonal workers. And uh, this is the initiative has been uh, started by a number of artists and artists collectives in collaboration with the trade union Pro G. Austria, like most European countries, has put in place processes that illegalize migration, and this, in turn, has led to shortages of exploitable labor. During the pandemic, Austria has had to organize a special, a special flying visa regime for workers from East European countries so that they could, could come to pick the, the asparagus and salad in Austrian uh, fields. These workers were provided with no epidemiologically safe accommodation nor medical care. To counter this, Sezonieri has been working with migrant seasonal workers to prevent exploitation, improve working conditions, and, and help enforce their rights. In their outreach activities, activists go onto farms to meet the workers, facing the threat of trespassing on private land. land. In the midst of the pandemic, however, Sezonieri have put out a list of demands uh, for higher wages, better sanitary conditions, and compensation for the increased health risk incurred by mig migrant agricultural workers, as well as for the abolition of nativist and anti-migrant discourses, the decriminalization of migration, and the creation of a more just system of food production. The immediate response is, uh, how am I doing with time? Uh, do I have more time or should I maybe quit and... No, and you have more it? time. Okay. You have. Um, I'll, I'll do a bit of reflection now on uh, the pandemic period and then uh, politicization of, of uh, care labor in that period. Um, the immediate responses and long-term consequences of the pandemic were hard to read at its onset. The unprecedented suspension of routine activities and the sudden explosion of the need for care made us consider that the illegibility of the situation could not be well comprehended by well-worn theoretical framings, but that the radical uncertainty of the situation required to stay close to the practices that responded to the needs as they emerged. 
However, as the pandemic wore on, it was hard not to see how the responses and the consequences started to consolidate. Firstly, despite the wealth of grassroots solidarity initiatives and some unprecedented relief measures taken at the governmental level in various countries, a uh, strong political mobilization aimed at the failures of care systems, either locally or internationally, uh, has remained largely subdued. There were protests, but they faded in comparison to the anti-lockdown protests. In contrast to reactions in other historical moments of major crisis, there seems to have been serious difficulty in finding ways of organizing that are effective political responses to the situation. For instance, implementing the kinds of welfare reform that would be necessary at the relevant scale to meet people's needs in such a crisis would have implied inevitably a radical change to current taxation regimes or elderly care. As nothing much has changed since the pandemic, many exas exasperated caregivers or care laborers have simply left the care system. Caring for people's lives is increasingly being organized through regimes of property and uh, the regulated labor markets. And these developments have only accelerated during the pandemic. Here I want to outline three trends within the world of big capital that are shaping the practices through which care provision is organized. Um, sorry, uh, okay. Um, so firstly, an acceleration in the deregulation and digitally controlled division of labor. The accelerated digitization of all aspects of life in the pandemic has led to a significant transformation of labor conditions. Those who can work in the safety of their homes have come to depend on digital platforms for their work, for delivery of groceries and medicines, as well as for contact with their friends and families. Their needs were being catered to by a mushrooming army of low-wage care workers, warehouse pickers, and couriers or deliverers who have had to continue moving along the logistical vectors. The pandemic lockdown thus had, has led to a precipitous increase in the rate at which both telework and needs for provision work or care work are being transformed into forms of what Ursula Hughes has called log labor, coordinated, quantified, and measured through apps and platforms. Similar processes have engulfed education, culture, and recreation. Big tech corporations have readily embraced their central position in the coordination of this new pandemic life. Amazon, Deliveroo, and an endless roster of other delivery services have expanded to meet this exploding demand, unflinchingly piling pressure on their staff to work at a breakneck pace. In a parallel process, the kinds of tech companies that primarily command technology and data rather than labor were aiming for an increase in public esteem. Google and Apple, so opposed to labor-intensive Amazon, could thus claim a role of benevolent public health advocates, creating a privacy-preserving contact tracing protocol and regularly releasing community mobility reports to monitor the effects of lockdown measures. Meanwhile, Zoom, WhatsApp, and other communication services were de determining our capacity to work, socialize, and organize. Differences between those companies aside, this sudden dependence on private digital platforms, dubbed uh, by Naomi Klein as the Screen New Deal, has created windfall profits for the techno-capitalist oligarchy. The financial markets are awash with money that had nowhere to be invested amid the largest global economic uh, contraction since the Second World War, have also secured fantastic increases in their wealth. Second, healthcare systems in many countries had already been deliberately disaggregated. High value treatments have been privatized and private clinics have been allowed to extract high returns on those treatments. While public healthcare systems were tasked with basic healthcare provision and disease prevention, areas that were constantly underfunded and under-resourced. With governments ignoring the warnings of scientists that an epidemic of this kind was only a matter of time, 
the capacity to produce medical supplies and conduct epidemiological responses in the face of any such emergency had been severely cut over the years. Thus, governments found themselves dependent on the private sector for the speedy delivery of uh, protection equipment, test and trades procedures, and ultimately the vaccines. This retreat from the public provision is widespread, but is arguably best evidence in the field of high-tech medicines, where the domination of big pharma, to go, together with the slow but ongoing process of divestment from public research and development, has led to reduced capacity for the production of medicines that would address public health concerns. The first COVID-19 vaccines were thus developed by venture-capitalized private research startups. The unprecedented public funding they received and the advance orders for the vaccines placed prior to their finalization socialized the risk of developing these new treatments, but the resulting market valuations, profits and patents have all remained private. The net effect of this market-dependent approach was that the less affluent part, part of the world was left to its own devices, waiting long time for vaccines. The novel approach to quick delivery vaccines championed by BioNTech and Moderna is based on messenger RNA, which is also projected to be essential for custom treatments for cancer and heart diseases. This branch of medical research is dominated by private companies and closed patents. Future high value precision medicines are thus likely to remain in private ownership meaning that in the future, this model of development is likely to siphon off even more resources from public healthcare systems, making them even less capable of responding to future public healthcare crises and making the availability of treatments even more highly uneven. Tommy, I'm going to interrupt you. Sure. Um, we, need to, we need to wrap up in a okay, let me, few moments. Um, Thank you. Uh, I just have like two, three minutes more. Sure, okay. What these processes share is that they are part of an accelerated conversion of care provision into assets. That is a specific kind of private property that focuses on profits from the rising value of financial assets. This is part of the wider trend toward the financialization of ever larger categories of provision of goods and services, and it, cre it creates the basis for financial capital to exert control over the future development of large swaths of social systems without necessarily holding direct ownership or responsibility for them. Essential care provisions such as health, assistance for the elderly, housing, education, and so on, are being increasingly assetized. While at the same time, pensions, healthcare insurance, and savings of many ordinary people have come to depend on the income generated by these same processes of assetization. Uh, assetization is thus progressively locking, locking in ever greater number of people into a trend in social development that will create even more radically segregated societies while expropriating us from our very capacity to shape the future. Uh, and just to finish, um, in the absence of other means to mobilize around the future of care provision, it is urgent that laws that support imperial processes of assetization and the intensification of an unequal division of labor are disobeyed and politicized. And that process we have understood as pirate care. Okay, I'll end here uh, and we can discuss more uh, if there are questions, which I'm happy to answer. Let me just uh, leave my uh, screen sharing mode so you can see me. We can see you. Well, I, I wasn't able to see, you know, um, yeah, the presentation, but that's, that's not an issue, I hope. Um, Tommy, um, I'd like to thank you very much for um, for the fantastic, in my opinion, um, material you presented. Um, I have studied uh, Pyaka, um closely, so that's why I was able to to follow. Um, probably people here have a lot of um, questions, um, but. Um, I, I will start <laughs> despite this. Tommy, are you there? 
Yeah, I can hear Great. it. And I can, I can see you. I can hear me, but you can't. You can't. You can't be seen now. Now I cannot see. Oh, you. really? Like, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. You're somewhere there. You're a voice. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I hope others can see me. That's really. Can, can other people see Tommy now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, first of all. Right, okay, now we're getting messages to say yes, so I, I just can't see you, but... <laughs> um, I mean, you mentioned that the, the project started um, four years, four years ago, and you, we can all, we can already find in the project, um, if, if you read through, you know, the, the brilliant website you've got. And I think it's, for me at least, it's one of the most adequately, beyond adequately theorized um, uh, presentations of the material you've got. Um, so the project is young. I mean, uh, it started four years back and you already have mapped out um, very important issues such as the criminalization of solidarity and dissent, the, um, the impact of technology, both in um, stealing, <laughs> you know, social care and kind of claiming it uh, back. But I, my first question is that um, since the project started, we have seen, at least I have seen, an unprecedented, I would say, increasing criminalization of solidarity and dissent um, in both countries where um, where I am, like in in the UK and in Greece. In Gre Greece is a border country where we have the criminalization of people trying to save other people from the sea in a very brutal way. And I could go on describing in detail what this means. Um, we have a carceral system where people who, um, some of them, are, uh, most of them actually are ingress themselves who kind of steer the boat so that it doesn't go down. They get carceral sentences of 200 years. Um, we're talking about, num yes, so th this is a big issue that the sentences imposed on the people um, who are seen to be the leaders, you know, under the name of smugglers, right? Very close, close to piracy um, in the boats, who may not have been actually the people who have taken them to the middle of the sea, because sometimes they go away and they live a migrant kind of with, you know, to steer the wheel of the boat. They get sentences of 100 and 200 years. Um, this is very little known. We have uh, people like Greek people who, um, who are in boats as we speak. And we have shipwrecks of and, and, and dead people every day, including today, like 10, I don't know, 60 people today, like every day, every day this, this is happening. So it's at the scale, it's at the scale, which is far worse. I mean, it can't be described calmly anymore. <laughs> right. Hmm. And I think it, it's happening. There's all sorts of complications there, but it's at the scale that. Um, it probably, it, it can't be addressed, can only be addressed minimally by any kind of pirate care kind of operating in the sea like we have seen in the past few years. So um, I think this escalation, for instance, of this, of, of this problem, um, the criminalization even of dissent moving to the UK where we, we already had um, uh, people in kind of the new concentration camps, actually, just as we speak, again, kind of um, rebelling of sorts. Um, the press presenting it in a very specific way. Uh, and we also have uh, frequently in the news what very people, very few people know or pay attention to, the new police bill, right, in the UK, which is going to criminalise kind of any kind of pro protest, basically, in, in public including, of course, I mean, that's what they're trying to target mostly and against environmental destruction. So we, I mean, my, I'm not sure that we could call this uh, state just neoliberal with the word liberal somewhere in, which is just about the deregulation and so on. 
I think we have moved to um, what some people call totalitarian capitalism. I mean, this term exists since 2010. And neoliberalism has remained, I mean, has happened already, but it's in the market, okay? So it's still happening. I mean, whatever few things are left to take through mortgages, through, you know, destroying any kind of um, healthcare system. But the, precisely the criminalization of solidarity is such that I'm not sure. I'm not sure that um, smaller scale efforts, smaller scale scale efforts, can can address it. Mm. Do, do you think it's? I mean, we need we need a network, a huge network, of pirate care projects. Yeah, well, I think that uh, there are different levels of organizing to address different levels of problem. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, they do not exclude uh, the reason for existence of each other. No, that um, large scale organizing against mass criminalization of migration or assistance to migration uh, migrants uh, requires more than uh, a single organization, more than uh, a small network of organizations. Um, uh, however, I think within um, the larger political field, things are sometimes contingent. Maybe I can speak through an example. Uh, as Croatia is uh, where I'm based, uh, uh, soon to join Schengen uh, uh, area, uh, it has been policing uh, on behalf of Frontex uh, the border uh, between the EU, uh, that means Croatia, and primarily Bosnia and, and Serbia, pushing back violently migrants who have been trying to cross. and. Um, this has been happening for a number of years until a television crew uh, and a team of journalists were able to actually film the police beating people on the border. And after that, uh, things have radically changed, so much so that uh, people are just issued a seven day um, uh, sort of ordinance to leave rather than being pushed back. And after that might get deported, but most of uh, the people currently are able to uh, go further north uh, into other countries of EU. Uh, however, yes, I do agree that we need a uh, different level of organizing to address um, the draconian uh, imposition of uh, economic systems. and. I mean, theoretical debates uh, about neoliberalism and the state could be had, you know, about the uh, market freedom and how much it required uh, heavy-handed state intervention and creation primarily of property rights, which meant also expulsion of population, which meant also dispossession. So many things that, that were in the, in the key of violence. Uh, so there is nothing in that sense uh, uh, new to new neoliberalism uh, today than it was maybe 40, 50 years ago, uh, insofar as it requires violence, extra economic violence to uh, be implemented and then to uh, be sustained. However, people have been commenting that uh, uh, there is more and more a punitive character to it, where you punish your home populations, not only over through formats such as uh, workfare, but also through direct criminalization. Will Davis has called that punitive neoliberalism, as opposed to sort of neoliberalism of the markets. I'm not sure that that that's uh, something that we can periodize, but I, I, there is a point uh, there. Um, so, yes, many of the practices that we work with are of the small scale, 
but they are effective on their small scale. Some of them are not small scale, like digital piracy is really large scale. And um, uh, for instance, Science Hub, uh, a shadow library and a search engine for paywalled academic articles makes available 80% of all paywalled uh, art academic articles out there. So it's a systemic transformation and it has reverberated on, on the field of academic publishing in all sorts of ways and, and uh, pushed uh, commercial publishers to try to navigate different forms of commodification of academic work, which are for the worse, but uh, that's, you know, the field of struggle. It shifts as, as, opposition, as, as, opposition and, and, uh, as opposition and resistance shifts. So, um, I would say that uh, what we are trying to achieve with documenting and helping various initiatives uh, write uh, about their experience, uh, transpose their first-hand organizing knowledge is at the, at the scale that is practicable to them. And uh, in that sense, we are trying to stay true to them. Uh, but uh, that said, we are now pursuing another another project, which is called Snaji Sidruja in, in uh, our uh, Slavic languages here in the Balkans, which means um, figure it out, comrade, which uh, probably has its roots in the Second World War resistance struggles, where you as member of resistance would be given uh, a mission, an impossible mission, and then you would ask your superiors, but how, how do I do it? And they would say, figure it out, mate. And this has become sort of an uh, idiom uh, in socialism to denote how people are coping to get by, to, to survive when systems are, are no longer functional and working. Mm -hmm. And frequently when people lie, cheat and steal, even from the position of no power, there's moral judgment and legislative legal judgment uh, on them. And we want to push back against this form of criminalization uh, to say that um, certain forms of provision, for instance, for migrants who are deeply excluded in uh, societies where they move to, uh, are not really uh, individual forms of behavior, but are systemic uh, effects. And what these types of behavior allow, be they pirate care or be they figuring it out is that you redefine conditions under which you um, um, live and you interact with others, be that humans or non-human mm. nature around us. So I would say that's, that's um, sort of a common thread that we are pursuing. How do people reclaim the conditions of their existence? And if you want to have sort of a, a Historical analogy, pirate ship is that exact thing. You no, know, under uh, the imperial seas, the crew on pirate ships were the crews on, on the pirate ships were defining or reclaiming the conditions of their own existence. Um, so, yeah, that's maybe mm. sort of historically what how we could read piracy. Yes, uh, sp speaking about history, I think that. Um, if I understood correctly, the syllabus, the very inputs I read through <laughs> um, that you've created and is incredibly uh, useful and I think shows the character of the project, um, kind of coincided with an exhibition which was about we cannot have any more a good life, right? The VHV exhibition in Vienna, Kunsthal, which was about, uh, called, I think, uh, bread, wine, where is Not bread, yeah. Bread something, wine, uh, security and peace. Bread, wine, cars, security and peace. You see, I keep repeating wine. <laughs> there is wine. I, was, I, know, I know, I know, I know. But um, when I was writing, typing down the name, I, w I was repeating the word wine for some reason. I don't know why. Anyway, so 
I think there's an incredibly important dimension, which is indeed um, um, something that people have not realized. I think that the former generation kind of had experienced, you know, capitalism, just the emergence of neoliberalism kind of in the 70s, for instance, or at least in many Western um, uh, countries and so on. It was, there was the expectation that they would, li they would live a certain kind of life as a labor aristocracy or whatever, and they would have access to things. And also this petit bourgeois notion of being always kind of, you know, within the frame of the law, being legal. And I think now most people will find that it's impossible to be fully legal. <laughs> like, I mean, we all uh, somehow, like the, the bureaucratic state is so tight around us and so on that most of us find ourselves in conditions of illegality, which I think ties very well with this idea of piracy from kind of, you know, downloading films, which is the simplest thing that was done or is being done, or getting access to knowledge like books and so on to, to, to other things, you know, like having an au pair, which is not legal anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, so, so we, I can go on and on and mention various things, but what I'm saying is that this is a very important difference to 30, 40 years back, a different generation Hyde was experiencing, you know, the, the, the kind of spread of neoliberalism. And today, in addition, of course, with the environmental fact that governments don't say to the people that, um, you know, you can't have these nice things because the resources are not there. And I am wondering, because of the investment in technology that I see in this project, the, the, the investment is the wrong word, the reliance perhaps on digital formats and so on. We are in an energy so-called crisis where, at least in the UK, it looks like we're going to have outages that is power cuts for a few hours. I mean, I've already received my notes and everything about this. So how will, I mean, we're so, pre technology is so precarious because everything's electricity. So I don't know in the current climate whether there should be alternative means necessarily very local, just local. Hmm. Yeah. And even through the nuclear, I mean, I was reading again about the nuclear uh, threat, which is very real, but most, again, we don't dare believe in it, that only all fast on radios would be, <laughs> you know, would be working. So nothing of the technology that we're using now. A very mm -hmm. kind of old kind of analog radio would be working for some reason. So my question is, when we're on the cusp, I mean, we're told, we're told, you know, um, that that we're at the moment where electricity is not a given anymore. Mm. How are we going to maintain this? perhaps necessary faith in technology of long distance, you know? You know? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to respond to systemic breakdowns. No, yeah. there is no... I think they're very new for us, yes. Yeah, yeah but um, I guess the first weeks of the start of the pandemic lockdown and mm. the pandemic itself um, in Europe showed that people can easily shift modes and find different ways of organizing mm -hmm. the everyday, you know? Obviously, this is all technology intense, as I have described it. Even care organizing was, were it not for various, um, I don't know, telegram groups or whatever your um, chat channel of, uh, tool of choices and mm -hmm. um, syllabi that were on the internet and all that. So it's technology intense in many ways. Um, uh, but fundamentally, it's about labor, and it's frequently physical labor that goes into sustaining each other. So cooking meals, um, bringing them to somebody's doorstep, uh, just going out and trying to source something that somebody's missing, and, and things like that, or just uh, helping an early person uh, um, change their clothes or any of those things are deeply physical and uh, they are necessary. So yeah. 
there is plenty to work to go around once everything goes down, I feel. So uh, I, I'm not so fearful for uh, for how people, how we can respond in uh, situations when they do happen. The problem is obviously that we are uh, dressaged to be individual and that we feel uh, encroached by anything that conditions our individual freedoms and we rarely have the opportunity to build our collective freedom to deliberate collectively on how do we do something together um, and uh, that's a political uh, thing that we need to nurture in, in many sorts of ways organizing political organizing does that even in the periods of deep um, defeat, which I think the current period mm. in many respects is. No? Um, yeah, who's, who's defeat? That's interesting. Like, I mean, is the neoliberal, I mean, the system's defeat, our defeat, you know. Um... It's a strange situation. Now we have sort of huge expansion of the state. Uh, huge, yeah, yeah. Of, of, yeah. Uh, Keynesian uh, state that supports a lot of and it. there's surveillance state. That's the other thing. Like uh, we're being we're, we're being watched all the time. Yeah, we're, uh, we're under this technology all the time. Is that that is transforming into any any sort of structural uh, uh, transition to a better place? You no, know? that's that's the difference from the Keynesian state of say. Uh, post-war period, when all states were developmental states, they were striving for a certain level of uh, um, social um, stability and many of them to some level of redistribution, mm -hmm. be they capitalist, be they socialist or be they post-colonial or, and, and, or anti-colonial. Uh, but that's gone. No, now we have expansionary state, which looks nothing like the expansionary state looked in the 60s or 70s um, under developing industrialism. Um, and now we are hitting the borders of what's ecologically sustainable. Um, and fewer and fewer people can uh, relate to the way sustainability is approached and it's approached as if there is no distributive conflict in that whereas there is it's all about a distributive conflict now who will carry the burden of um, climate destabilization uh, or who will carry the burden of climate uh, action of climate policies no and that uh, is a fundamental question which needs to be addressed uh, while we are in, in the eye of the storm, in a way, or, or as we are progressing in the, into the eye of the storm, because the only way policymakers are willing to address it is technological restructuring plus, plus uh, markets, but that is not going to do the work. It's obvious. You know, last week, uh, UN Environmental Programme published uh, their annual gap emissions report, and... Yeah. and there is a clear statement that it's not working out, that structural, deep transformations are needed. Yeah. Um, I want to, because this is a huge theme, which I, we're not going to solve now. I want to ask very quickly before I um, open um, and invite others to 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 pose their questions. <coughs> the, the, the collective, the project, Pirate Care, has been a multi-skills, you know, um, collective as I've understood it, or project, and you have various people there, and you also have artists, right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask, given the context in which we're having this conversation, how is the artistic labour, art, you know, that goes into this work different to other kinds of work? Is it different? I mean, is there something particular that we can get as uh, because, because we work, you know, um, mm. on and in the art field? Uh, well, concretely related to pirate care, uh, obviously this project is very much situated within uh, art and culture as a field. Mm. Uh, it, that's where it kind of 
gets its support most of the time, like this occasion tonight. Um, and many types of interventions that we do are uh, cultural interventions. Uh, for instance, as we couldn't do a, a summer camp where we would to collectively learn from the syllables, we organized an exhibition in Rijeka and uh, it's a documentary exhibition, most of it, but it included also what some people see as artworks, like uh, Paula Pin from formerly from Jin and Pang, she sees her work uh, with um, um, hormone hacking and, and testing devices as a form of artwork. So um, it does include artwork. Uh, and what we are trying to do is uh, when we work with artists is that there is a form of redistribution of the resources that we have uh, and um, that everybody's uh, paid. Nobody's paid well and, uh, good <laughs> enough. <laughs> yes. That's, I guess, the doom of uh, uh, still, no, there is an, uh, an expressed effort to do that. And then to, whenever, in during the pandemic, for instance, we have nurtured this ethos, whenever we get an invitation, we would pass it on to people we were working with. You know, and we would facilitate that, but would either step back or moderate or just give more room and then resources, finances, whatever, uh, to people we were working with, organizations that we were working with, uh, initiatives and ultimately artists we were working with. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that piracy would have been openly openly tolerated if it wasn't for artistic autonomy yeah definitely. i think I, th I think art was a necessary part even if it came through the, this kind of multi-skill teams okay um so it's yeah not tolerated in the sense that you know it's not tolerated it's in the sense that uh we who do this also sometimes come under repression no it's not right. without consequence it's doesn't stay in the, the safe zone of art. No. Okay, that's, I think, a very, very important um, observation. And I would like to invite um, my colleagues now to, to yeah, to <laughs> ask you questions. So, are there any comments or questions you'd like to address to Tommy or even me? <laughs> or both? I think Karen has raised her hand. Uh, no, oh, yes. Karen, I can see Karen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for your really, really amazing uh, presentation of your work. Um, I have a question which goes in a similar direction as um, Angela's question. Uh, it's about the dimension of your work and how you think of um, an expansion of it. Um, and related to that, I would also be interested how you work with the um, classical NGOs who are in this field, who are active in this field, um, when it like Doctors Without Borders and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. How, how do you see your own work um, related to that work or with uh, you were talking about green, climate action, how you see it related to Greenpeace and, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, do, do you think it makes sense to collaborate with these NGOs or to, rather to distinguish, distinguish your work from those classical old NGOs who are yeah, partly in the same field as you are? Um. Yeah, pirate care is conceptually uh, rigidly delimited. You know, we are interested in those forms of organizing care that are willing to uh, uh, disobey laws. You know? So kind of that's, we are not really interested in all sorts of uh, humanitarian or care efforts. That's not to say that 
we have particular disliking of uh, doctors without borders or Greenpeace. No, okay. I mean, I'm also in, in ecology, so I, I could talk about these things, but strictly speaking from the point of view of pirate care, uh, we are not interested in that. We are interested in Sea Watch uh, or Juventa or um, SOS Mediterranean, and who themselves are uh, affiliated to um, Doctors Without Borders. It's it's just that we we are looking at uh, the forms of articulation of problems around care provision and right of everyone to get the essential care, the care, care that they are rescued if they are drowning in the Mediterranean. So uh, it's, it boils down to, to that for us uh, conceptually. You know, that's uh, what the, this project was really about, you know, that, that um, we tried to problematize uh, the legality and uh, uh, try to point at legitimacy of illegal actions, political legitimacy of illegal actions, which these actors frequently claim. Um, <clears throat> so um, I don't know if that answers, but... Um, yeah, the expansion uh, part of it. Uh, such a, uh, uh, what do you mean by expansion, if you can just clarify? Yeah, if, if um, how big can uh, pirate care become? How, how many uh, members? Uh, well, um, this was for us a research endeavor, you know, and it still is. Um, we are trying to connect with these organizations that <laughs> in our uh, definition fit that uh, form of uh, agency of pirate care, and we try to connect them. But we are not really building a big uh, project out of that of uh, bringing together all forms of pirate care. There is you no. Know, it's just uh, we are limited first to a very lim to a, to a very small geography. It's. Um, somewhere between Western and Eastern Europe, first, second wor world, global north, we would call it in today, geopolitical uh, mapping, but uh, uh, so it lacks many dimensions uh, of the predicaments and, and the structural elements of what drives uh, the denial of care. Um, but it can be also, I, I think, thematized as also an eminently first and second world problem care uh, insofar as its popularity over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years has a lot to do with the crisis of welfare systems. No, So uh, it became uh, a way to articulate or sometimes to um, beat around the bush of that problem. Um, and um, we also, in that sense, are a bit critical on, on what, what uh, how care systems are organized and they need radical uh, reorganization. So now in our work, current work, we are working quite a bit with how do we uh, support processes of care laborers and care recipients within care systems, regardless if it's community sort of like activist or institutional because institutions need to also be politicized and uh, we are working quite a bit with um, uh, Trieste that has had uh, a transformative model of care organizing, territorial care organizing since the 1980s um, and um, the political moment that brought about that system, which emerged in the late 70s and early 80s, is now generationally petering out and is also under attack of, from various forms of com com commercialization, commodification of care. But we are interested in knowing like, how do we instill more politics into the this provision systems of care, which are large, they're far larger than 
anything communities can organize. Communities fill gaps usually, and they cover the the denial, the exclusions. They they provoke the system, but uh, they cannot replace that system of, of care. Just imagine, you know, like healthcare system. It's uh, so complex and um, so. Yeah, I don't know if that answers in terms of expansion. That's where our interest is currently. No. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I muted myself. I think an important parameter of the theorization that care politics receives in the pirate care project is that, and this is what interests me, is that you connect the um, maybe what I would call the reformative with the transformative. I mean, you say very openly uh, on the side that you're against private property. So you, you don't neglect to state what the horizon is about. That this is set. I mean, this is piracy is politicized by being basically kind of uh, challenging the, re the property regime. Mm. And that is the fundamental. And then in the practical, in the practical, yes, in the realization, in the many dimensions where piracy is realized, then of course, practical action needs to be taken. But in terms of the theorization of the project, this is very clear. And I think, uh, yeah, it, it comes up kind of early on. Um, it's not hiding somewhere. It's not being implied. It's there. So... I just want to make this clear in case, because care very often is actually used as a kind of repair that doesn't have a bigger project or a bigger idea or a bigger challenge behind it. And I think this is a differentiation, yeah, for pirate care, which is important. Yeah, it's frequently a political, whereas the problems that are besetting the the field of yeah. care yeah. or interdependence are deeply political, and that's. Um, where we are trying to tease out what is what can be done there, articulated politically. Okay, yeah. care is really around radical articulations. You no, know? mm, the thing that we are doing with um, care provisioning uh, institutions is maybe less radical. You no, know? it's not abolitionist in that sense. It's trying to instill uh, a swerve of politics into the institutions that have been depoliticized thoroughly and the 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 meaning of care has been also in that sense depoliticized um disempowering primarily patients you know, or care receivers who who are just seen in very instrumental way and uh as this part of the world is moving into an older and older uh, generational structure, mm. structure of, of the dem demographic, uh, there will be an extreme expansion uh, in the need for for various forms of care for the elderly primarily. You know? And then uh, it's a challenge to think what will happen with that. Uh, for instance, in, in Barcelona, there uh, social innovation office is now starting to develop uh, assistant robots that can help huge number of elderly who are living alone at home. You know? And now the question is, is that good or bad? You know? But how do you find so many carers uh, to, to cater for a population of 200,000 elderly in a city such as Barcelona? You know? And uh, therefore, there are challenging times ahead. Uh, the population is getting older. There is less and less people who can provide care. Countries in the European um, peripheries, such as Greece, such as Croatia, have been bleeding uh, care workers to uh, countries of the um, European uh, center. Um, medical workers as well and and there are huge care gaps that will beset a number of societies so this is i think the challenges that we'll be grappling also from the institutional point of view and 
they involve many issues, including migration. No, uh, I think migration is at the center of it. Yeah. I'm very much at the center, so which is uh, interesting. But I think I, I think yes, uh, there is there are a number of a number of strategies that we see, like the uh, euthanasia is pushed very much. Um, but basically suicide, that's what it is, you know, assisted suicide. So this is pushed very much like the Jean-Luc Godard way. Um, and the I think it's important to note that not only the state has withdrawn from care responsibilities, it is actively against the citizens, which I think is another level of, it's not just withdrawal, there's a clear attack, there's the perception which is being pushed every time we have a, a big kind of like debt or financial crisis, that people live too long, you know, um, or that the age of, um, uh, of work should increase, I don't know, to 70, it has already, and then to 80 or whatever. So wh what I'm saying is that there's an actual attack by the state, the capitalist state, on its citizens, and that this is happening. It's not just withdrawal of care. We can no longer talk about withdrawal. We're talking about a kind of necropolitical attack on the so-called economically inactive uh, populations. Mm. So um, we're nearly the end of our time here tonight. So I would like to invite um, any uh, remaining um, comments or questions, please. Especially that relates. Okay, okay. Hey, there's yes. somebody. Gabor, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you very much for both of you for this conversation and okay. for you especially. Uh, for the, the presentation and I have just a comment or maybe a question I don't know uh, whether do you think it would be possible to use because I, I really liked what Angela you brought up that uh, neoliberal because it contains this this word liberal is not really uh, working anymore for for this kind of thing and I'm from Hungary I'm researching Eastern Europe and uh, I I use the term illiberal a lot in my in my work and maybe illiberal neo illiberalism could be could be something <laughs> that uh, considering the ways um an illiberal state is is or seems to be uh, able to go even further in these attacks against uh, its own citizens when it comes to uh, yeah basically many issues but but yeah now i'm thinking about what you uh, mentioned tomislav uh, the the ban on homelessness like homelessness uh, as such as illegal in hungary but right now actually there's a huge uh, mobilization project because the regime made it uh, practically impossible for uh, teachers to to go on strike, and so since the the institution of strike is is emptied out, uh, it's a huge movement. Uh, many many teachers who were deeply depoliticized before are going on uh, public disobedience uh, days actually because they they cannot uh, legally strike. So I'm just yeah mm, throwing this idea of the neo illiberalism into the into the bouquet. And thank you again. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, yes, well, um, one could understand maybe liberal state or liberal democratic state of the developmental period as developmentalist period or as, as sort of place where um, both recognition and distribution were uh, expanding and then illiberal is a state that divides the population so or pits the population against each other to to instill rights to a segment of a population you know? and that's how i would read for instance the welfare chauvinism in in hungary or poland at uh, at the moment i mean it's happening everywhere no, it's or, or britain okay. or Sorry. Britain, yeah. yeah in greece uh, yeah just ever. I, I, political spaces are, are particular and specific, no? So we should 
uh, sometimes generalize the phenomena, but we should also sometimes look at the concrete um, political uh, terrains and, and uh, try to um, grapple with the problems that are generating uh, their uh, particular uh, outlay, you know, um, uh, the lay of the land in a way. So, but yeah, thank, thank you for those thoughts. Okay, um, well, it's exactly seven o'clock on my British clock. So, <laughs> um, I think actually, uh, yes, we have, we're done for time, unless you would very quickly like to add something. Um, yes, no, somebody wants to add something. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, just really quick, um, I wanted to acknowledge this thought of um, sort of like the state attacking its own citizens and particularly the citizens that are not um, economically valuable or, or active. Um, I did a, just like a little seminar work on care work um, and there's re I'm from Switzerland and there's research um, being done um, in Switzerland, which you would think, okay, this is very central Europe and, and you know, this couldn't be the worst care system in Europe. However, there has been um, um, studies now done that many um, care workers have to or reside to um, giving neuroleptics to old people that um, don't need that and there's the amount is increasing every year and it's, um, it's sort of like a, something that that care workers are really really sad and and um, feel bad about but sort of have to because they have so many patients on one care worker and they're at the end of it um, yeah, and I sort of thought of, of your comment now, um, Angela, about how this is an attack on on citizens um, by just drugging them, basically. And yeah. Yes, obviously, I think, I, I, sorry, go on. No, obviously it's, it's difficult um, because one should not blame care workers because care workers are just sort of like at the front edge and, and having to distribute neuroleptics because that's what you know the system pushes them to do but yeah I wonder what you what you say about that I mean first of all I'd like to say that um whereas pirate care you know defends actually the um defense illegality because piracy is considered um not considered abstractly, <laughs> according to the law, actually defined as illegal and criminal. I think that um, we need to turn the tables around and start talking openly about a criminal state. It's, it's the state that is criminal, and we should no longer actually bear the brunt of criminality and solidarity, that at least in the public, um, where public opinion is concerned, this discussion needs to completely turn the tables that we live in criminal states. I mean, it's not an exception, it's the rule. That, that's what I was trying to say before. And I think this could be uh, an objective of projects like the amazing, actually, um, um, uh, Pirate Care, but also other projects because, you know, the, the, how a network could be not just documented, but you know, carry on is a different thing, but calling the state criminal for me is fundamental. Yeah, I think that's we should. Also what, um, mm. Sorry, it's also what forensic architectures work is about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, definitely. So I think, in in my view, we should view the trajectory of development of state as a formation as having been fully subsumed to um, a dominative structure, you know, a structure that assumes domination. There's um, a great book by uh, an American um, political scientist, Adam 
Yatichel, uh, who has analyzed anti-colonial states. And she has tried to argue against um, sort of a cliche uh, in uh, left communism that views uh, anti-colonial struggles and national liberation struggles as failed attempts because they want to construct a state. And she goes on at great length to show that the construction of the state there was premised on uh, transforming the global system of states so that it becomes non-dominative, that the structures that create imperial hierarchies mm. that that are the legacies of pre-Westphalian uh, structure of states uh, be abolished. And to do so, they obviously had to form states, but it was not about founding states. It was about creating federations with other anti-colonial states and non-aligned states to uh, work against domination in, in the world system and then uh, trying to push for new economic order that would uh, that would overturn the, the dominative structure in the world economy. Now and then um, I think the structure of the state has been radically transformed. Its function has been radically transformed since uh, the 70s and 80s. Uh, uh, just because there is no uh, alternative to that imperial structure or hierarchy and differentiation between societies and states uh, that would have uh, viability as, as, a, as an alternative project to world system of capitalist states at the moment. No, that's, that's I think, the, the problem and that's the criminality of this state formation. I meant, I meant more specifically it's evolution, but I hear what you're saying. Um, yeah, I, I was talking about the evolution of the capitalist state specifically, <laughs> that whereas there would be a consensus before, I mean, what was being done to anarchists, if I can put it this way, you know, in the West, or what was done to Italian autonomia and so on, has now spread against practically, you know, uh, I'm not going to say all, um, but yeah, all dissenting actually citizens. So it's 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 a it's a huge it's a huge attack that we're seeing in 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 most parts and yeah, involving so protest. It. Yeah, um, I don't know if there's um, okay. Anybody else who would like to contribute? So I was just asked about the name of the book. Uh, yes. So the author is Atom A D O M Getacho. Uh, I, I can spell that down. Uh, and the book is World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination. Let me just put that for you here. Um, there's a bibliography. It's in the chat. Oops. Oh, there you go. Okay. So thank you very much, um, Tommy, for tonight's discussion and the wonderful present enlightening um, presentation. I would, if if you haven't read, if you haven't been to the Pirate Care uh, site, I I think it's great. I, it's worth re every sentence there is worth reading. That's my that's my finding. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for to all of you for joining. Um, Karen for hosting and we look forward to, to seeing you in the next event which is on the 8th of December on policy rather than piracy okay. which we discussed tonight so okay. thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank, you, you thank you thank you all thank the you for people joining. who are there bye, bye Tommy <laughs>